he had a choice on how he was going to respond to the rest of his life. And it's the same with you. And don't let Satan win. Honestly, what you need to do is say, let's start a compassion ministry. And what we're going to do, he has a billion stars he's, he's, he's in control of. He can deal with your and that God's saying, I don't want that. I want you to, to, to treat me like you would treat your best friend. Those are real feelings that we think we got to keep to ourselves like, shh, I don't know, God, where we can't know. He knows. All right, good morning. Welcome to those of you that are here for our part two uh, session in our Truth Matters series with Lynn Wilder. We are talking about Mormonism today. If you do not, um, if you did not see session one, please go back and watch that because that's her whole story. So right now we have question and answer. So we have lots of questions for um, for Lynn from the audience. So we're going to just ask you questions. Uh, you wanted to share something first. God so profoundly changed me, it, but it took me five years to get straight. I was wacko, emotional, ruined my health. It's very difficult to make the transition. Um, Mormonism is an identity. It's a culture. It's your family. Often it's your job. It's 24-7. It's everything you know. And it's not like going from the Methodist to the Presbyterian Church. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. So those of you who are witnessing to Mormons, please be willing to walk with somebody that you love through some really difficult times for a long time. Five years in Bible studies, bugging our pastor to death, going to church every time the doors were open, just to feel stable again. About the time I began to feel stable, the Holy Spirit started talking to me in prayer that I needed to write. I did not want to write. I did not want to write. So I proposed a book to Zondervan called Mormon Giants in the Land. I thought, oh, you know, during the election, they're going to want to know about the culture of Mitt Romney and, and Glenn Beck. The Zondervan editors looked at my uh, proposal, and I get a call from one of them, and she says, Honey, we want you to write a book, but not the book you pitched to us. We just want to hear your family story. Of course, my first reaction is, Lord, no. Not my emotionalism, my weakness, my ignorance, my stupidity my um, brokenness, my sins, not in public, Lord. And yet, he began to give me this book, Unveiling Grace, almost as a download. I knew it was his, his work and not mine, and I began to realize that he was at work among the Mormon people. So I'm going to read to you an email that I received Saturday night. This is God at work. After being told to read this book, called Unveiling Grace, by a very good friend and purchasing it in September of 2015, I have finally read this book yesterday, and I'm ashamed I didn't do it long before now. My life is blown. I'm a 41-year-old woman born and raised in the Mormon religion. I've had feelings of conflict and not feeling like I'm on the right path for many years, yet have done nothing to change it. They don't know where to go. We're not telling them. Yesterday, I started reading the New Testament as a child. See how this is a thing? Like I have never done before, and I am not able to put it down, nor your book down. I have gone through two pencils of lead and emptied a pen. Thank you, Sarah. P.S. I will be seeing you on Wednesday morning at the Bible study in Peoria. <laughs> okay. And she's Sarah, here. Sarah, would you stand, please? <laughs> We're so glad you're here. You know what? I think I need to move you back. I, I want to move you back so the people over there can see early. There you go. So that way that they better? can see. Yeah. I just want to make sure you guys can see. I her. want you to know the Holy Spirit is on the move with the Mormon people like this. Mm -hmm. And 
I beg you to step in the gap between your parallel universe and theirs. They are out there. They're figuring out Mormonism isn't true. Do you know that folks are just streaming out of the church right now? And they're going to atheism and agnosticism. Yeah. They don't know what your God can do. You have to tell them. Mm -hmm. I was taught Mormonism, you were lesser. We were greater. You only had the Bible. We had four books of scripture. You had a little of the truth. We had the fullness of the truth. That's a downright lie. Only biblical faith and only the word has the unmitigated, unadulterated truth. But who knows that? Mm -hmm. Now I have to tell you this, okay? I had Christian parents. I'm not sure they were saved when I was home growing up. But when I left home, they became so strong that my mom started Bible study fellowship on the south side of Minneapolis. There's also a woman in here today who went to that Bible study. Praise God. By the name of Wilder, how strange is that? <laughs> God, wow. People are streaming out and they need to know. My Christian family didn't tell me. My mom didn't come to my baptism. My sister wouldn't come to my baptism. But they never told me why. They went shopping in Brown County that day. My dad came. But that makes sense, though. Why? Because we don't know what to do. We don't want to go because we don't want to. We, we disagree with what you're doing as a as a parent. But then that's the question: Do we go and support your marriage in the temple? Do we like? Do you see? What I'm saying like, do we go yeah. and do things like that, even though we know it's so wrong? Yeah. Well. You can sure love somebody, but be bold about where you stand, right? Why not? Why not? I mean, I, okay, so the rest of, when I got saved and realized that Mormonism was a salt shaker at the end of the table, marching very honest, precious people who wanted Jesus right off the end of the cliff instead of the salvation, I was a little bit angry for a while that no one ever told me. Were you so afraid of breaking your relationship? You were going to march me right off the end of the table? Did it matter more to you how I saw you or that we had a relationship? Then you would at least try to have a loving conversation with me. And this is something we all have to ask ourselves about people that we know and love. The Bible says, right? You love God above all else, and then we love others above ourselves. Well, if you love, if I love Lisa more than I do myself, don't you think I better tell her about Jesus before there's no more opportunity? And so I've dedicated the rest of my life to do everything I can do mm -hmm. to help other people know the truth that so profoundly changed me. What? what let me try to articulate this change. I did not know I was in bondage until I got free. Mm -hmm. I now rest in Jesus. My life used to be this durable wheel of works, constantly going, and my brain raced all the time, and I couldn't sleep nights, and I had to make lists, and you know, I always had a schedule, and I got irritated if I got off schedule because I had to control everything. I know my Lord Jesus. I wake up in the morning, I acknowledge Jesus. I surrender the day to him. I allow him to bring things to me, and he does, believe me. If you're available and you're willing, he does. It's a very different way to live, to rest in Jesus. When I was rebaptized after Mormonism, I felt like I actually couldn't sleep day and night for about three days and felt like I needed to be rebaptized and all. And so I was, but um, I, we did it outside in living water because the Bible had been so amazing to me, that living water. And when I came up out of the water, God gave me this visual of, you know when Christmas story Marley is bound with all those chains? God gave me this visual of myself bound in all these chains, and when I came up out of the water, they burst. Mm -hmm. 
And it was one of the most profound experiences of my life. I am free, I am grateful to be free, and I want others to be free in Jesus. You know, it's interesting, Nabil Qureshi, when he talks about Islam, we, we talked about this in Bible study a couple weeks ago, how he, he said, no one ever shared Jesus with me. And he said, I finally came to the conclusion that either Christians don't care that I go to hell. I mean, and that, that is one of them. Like, or they really honestly don't believe that Jesus is the only way to God. So there's a disconnect somewhere. So we have to, but I think most of it, and even for me, I have a whole side <clears throat> that are of my family that are Mormons. And the hardest part to me is I don't know what to say to them. I, 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 they're so, you know, they're the temple recommend, and they're, the, they're, they're so busy working, and, and they just look at me like I'm crazy, and I don't know how to reach them. And I think that's what most of these questions are, is where do I begin? Like what, our first oh. question here was, how do you reason with a Mormon who is professionally successful and by all accounts has his life in perfect order, absent crisis, and absent God's intervention? And it, it's what you said. They believe that God is blessing them. But how do you reach somebody like that? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start in this place. First, you have to love them, and you have to pray for them. And I highly recommend this prayer. You know how the Bible says God is always at his work? 24-7. He doesn't have a body of flesh and bones like the Mormon God. He doesn't have to eat and sleep, and he doesn't need to have sex. He's always at his work. What's his work? His work is drawing people to Jesus. God is always softening someone's heart. He's always drawing someone to Jesus. And guess what? A lot of those people are right within your sphere of influence. They're people that you already know. Only you can't see spiritually, so you don't know God's working with them. We took a Bible study one time called Experiencing God by Henry Blackaby. And it says in there, ask God to show you who he's already working with around you. Right? I'm a new Christian. Mike and I are in this Bible study. These nice little Christians trying to um, disciple us are coming over Monday nights and we're doing this Bible study. Bible study says you need to pray this prayer. So we all pray this prayer. I don't know how big this new God is. I don't know what he can do. And I don't expect him to answer that prayer. I go into work the next morning. Professor at Florida Gulf Coast University in Fort Myers, Florida now. I go down this hall, and one of my colleagues says, hey, you, come here. I dreamed about you last night. My brain immediately goes, I'm sure this has nothing to do with the prayer that I prayed last night. <laughs> But I'll see what she has to say, right? I go in and I sit down. This is my dream. She said it was so amazing to me. She said, you and I went to Washington, D.C., and you were leading a tour group, she says to me. And this weird voice in my head kept saying, see her? What she says you need to hear, and where she goes, you need to go. And she said, I I'm running to try to keep up with you, and I can't keep up with you. So I hail a cab, and I say to the cab driver, see that lady over there? What she says, I need to hear, and where she goes, I need to go. So she said, the cab pulls up right next to you, and I try to get out, and the doors won't open, and I'm beating against the inside of this cab, screaming, what she says, I need to hear, and where she goes, I need to go. And I woke up. What do you think about that dream? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. I looked at what her a weird went, dream. <laughs> I don't have a clue. <laughs> but honest, I got up and I walked out. You know, I went down to my own office. I go home from work that day and I say to Mike, I tell him this weird story and I say, do you think that had anything to do with our, oh, I'm sure it had nothing to do with our prayer last night, right? <laughs> Three days later, she comes kind of marching down to my office slams the door, sits down in a chair in front of me, looks eye to eye and says, I don't think you understand. I've been praying about a personal relationship with Jesus, and I think he's sending me to you. Mm. It's like, hit me over the head with a two by four. <laughs> I don't know how to evangelize anybody. 
I'm a new Christian. I've never done this before. So I'm like, okay, I'll ask her some questions. So like, did you ever go to church before? Do you know anything about Jesus? Have you ever read the Bible? This is what she says to me. I'd lo- I had worked with this woman four years, so I kind of knew her on the surface, but I didn't know anything personal about her. She says to me, well, 10 years ago, when I was in law school in Europe, I joined the Mormon church. Um, this is Fort Myers, Florida. Only God would have known that. I could have worked side by side with her professionally for another 20 years and never known that. And yet he was drawing her to Jesus and she needed somebody who could help her sort truth from Mormonism. Mm -hmm. Mike and I walked with she and her husband for about a year and a half. They decided they were comfortable in this Nazarene church. They got plugged in. They're now in an Assembly of God church. It's years later and and she's doing great. He still struggles sometimes. He's... Um, grew up Catholic. God is working with people around you. Mm -hmm. And if you're willing to step into it, just a prayer like that might be helpful. I can't promise he'll always do something that crazy, but he does bring me people. That's a great point to know for for this person. It's like, all right, start praying. God, what, you got to open the door somehow. It might not be your relatives yet. They may be 10 years down the road. But only God knows those things, right? Our job is just to plant the word, plant the word, tell people what our Jesus is like, Mm -hmm. who he is. One girl wrote me and she said this, I'm a nurse who sees folks in their homes. It's my mission field. I pray that Satan stays out of my way. I'm usually with each client about 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, She said, I love my work and my mission. But since she moved here, she said, I've noticed there's lots of LDS folks and she said, I don't want to debate any of them, no. nor do I want to take a chance in losing my job, but rather give them a couple of questions that would give them uh, something to ponder about their faith versus what Jesus says. Could you ask Lynn Wilde what a few of these thoughtful questions might be? Well, I don't know if you're allowed to sprinkle God throughout your conversation, but every Christian should be. Oh, Amazing. I was praying about this the other day, and this happened, right? Or I was reading in the Word this morning. You guys believe the Bible, right? So I was, uh, I was reading in the Bible this morning, and I read this, and it just really touched me. Why would that be offensive, right? That doesn't hit against Mormonism. You don't have to know. If somebody's out of Islam, or you don't necessarily have to know about their culture, or about Mormonism, or where they're coming from. You just have to know how to offer your Jesus because they don't know what you know. They don't have what you have. They need what you need. So something simple like, who is Jesus to you? Okay. That's certainly one you could stew mm-hmm. on for a while, right? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. What was it about the Mormons at your door that converted you to? Like, what was it? Like, they come to the door, they tell you. Like, what was it that just like was like, oh, yeah, I think we'll believe this? They're loving, and they take you in like family. And I had a wonderful biological family, but they almost immediately supplanted my biological family. Very, very, very good. And especially if someone's having a hard time, if there's been a death in the family. My boys, when they went on their missions, said that they were taught to go through the paper and the obituaries and actually go visit the homes. And then you could bring the message that you can see your loved one again if you join the Mormon church and become a forever family. Micah, after he got saved, said he was so convicted about what he'd done, he literally went back to all the people that he had converted to Mormonism. Oh, bless his um, heart. Told them, I don't think, you know, it was wrong. I'm sorry. And uh, many of those have come to biblical faith. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. You have kind of an awesome son. Um, is a Mormon prophet a human being or just a voice? When he makes mistakes, they'll say he's a human being. Okay. Yeah. But, it, but what does he do? He tells, he sets the tone for the whole Mormon church. Can he go back and, because um, I know they, they, um, they change doctrine a lot, it seems like. Is he the one that changes doctrine? 
he and the other 14 men, at the, there are 15 men at the top. There's a prophet. He has two counselors and the 12 apostles. Those 15 men organizationally run the church, make the decisions, receive the revelations. They're called prophets, seers, and revelators. Mm -hmm. <sighs> and yes, uh, the Mormon God changes, and they're proud of the fact he changes. He updates with the times. So that, that is something you can talk about, how amazing your God is, how he knows all things from the beginning. He knows everything, you know, he knows who his sheep are, all those kind of things, right? And he's big enough to blow his nostrils and his enemies are gone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did Micah tell the pastor to challenge him that helped yes. him become a Christian? Years later, he did. They actually connected just a couple of years ago. That pastor now is a church around Chicago. And mm -hmm. yes, yes, he's a dear friend of ours. I've met him once. Okay. Uh, uh, did your whole family become Christians? All of my family left the Mormon church. Three of our four kids are in ministry okay. with Adams Road. Yeah. That's awesome. Now, Adams Road, mm -hmm. they go on the road, they sing and play music and tell their testimony, the, share the gospel. From works to grace. Okay. From works to grace. It's a universal message, from works to grace. So the Unveiling Grace book, just telling that story from works to grace, we've had Muslim converts, we've had folks out of Catholicism or Seventh-day Adventism or wherever they felt like they were more dedicated to the legalism rather than a relationship with Jesus. And that's a huge message, even within the church. I didn't get to the slide. Um, oh, they actually have slides up again. Maybe I can find it. There was a Pew study done. The antidote is the word of God. Amen. Here's the Pew study. Look at this. This should rock you. These are Christians in the U.S. Christian church. 36% um, of Christians say that God alone is needed. 62% say you have to do good deeds in order to get into heaven. So here's Catholicism. Only 17% of Catholics say that you're saved by grace, saved alone by Jesus. 81% say it's good works. See that? But look even at evangelicals. I mean... We are the ones who have more faith in God alone, right, as far as the study. But still, a lot of us still think we have to do works. And so that works to grace message in the book Unveiling Grace is huge, even for Christians who need to get rid of those chains and let go of that burden and uh, rest in Jesus and let him bring the work and the people to evangelize. What is wrong? Is it the, are, are the churches not telling us? Because like you said, you grew up in the Presbyterian church, never even knew you needed a, a relationship with Jesus. No. Can we turn Lynn up a little bit? I don't know why we can't hear her, and I'm way too loud. We know that. That's just me. <laughs> um, okay, try turning. Okay. But what is wrong with our churches? Are they, are we, what is the message? Are we, are we just going too culturally now and, and we're not telling the truth? I don't know what's going on. You know, I don't know anything about organized religion and I don't worry about it. I, when we bring folks to faith, we bring them to a knowledge of who God is, how big he is, that the Bible is reliable. That's a huge thing we have to deal with when people come to faith. There's all those evidences I was talking about, right? So once they get solid, it's about a relationship with Jesus and then knowing his word because truth matters. What his word says is how you're supposed to live your life. And sometimes even when people come out of Mormonism, They've always had an allegiance to the Mormon prophet, so then they think, okay, if this church isn't true, I'm going to have to find the one that is true, and then the pastor takes over that allegiance mm, okay. position, almost like a pope, and then as soon as he does something wrong, you're done with religion. People have to be connected to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one you have to walk with. Mm -hmm. One of the things God did with me in transition was all my Mormon friends went away, 30 years of friends. I didn't know anybody, and I only had one place to go. And so for five years, I was going this place until I got really solid with this place. And that's where Christians yeah. need to be. 
Yeah, I think so too. But I think it goes back to, you know, I was listening to, um, I don't know if it was Nabil or, or David Wood, and he was they were talking about how most, even for Islam, like you have Islam neighbors and nobody will ever, uh, Muslim neighbors, you'll never, uh, no one ever asks them to come over and visit. And he said, how in the world can we ever share the gospel if we don't get to know someone? And, and, but it's very intimidating because you, a Mormon comes in and you're just like, well, what if they say something and I don't have the answer? And, and there's all those, those crazy thoughts. So I think most of us just say, you know, I should call my cousins and go to lunch with them. But I'm just, it, it, I, ah. well, what I did do <laughs> is I sent him your book. But that didn't work, because <laughs> okay. I'm kind of apparently a baby. But but you know they don't because they're taught not to read things. Is that correct? Because they one of them sent it back and said, "Here's my testimony. Here's uh -huh. my so tell me what, what what that means." They're telling us you had a testimony. The only, the only way I would use the book on veil and grace with a really strong Mormon who's not questioning their faith, and I've done this a number of times, is say just be really humble and say, I used to be a Mormon. I wrote this book. It's got a lot of Mormonism in it. Will you read it and tell me if this is accurate? Does this seem to accurately reflect what your church believes? Because I don't want to be out there saying something that isn't true. Oh, that's good. And so literally then, again, remember I said respect, mm -hmm. putting them in the driver's seat so that they're the one that does the questioning. So then, literally, I had a stake president one time read the book, and he wrote in the margins, and he got back to me, and he would say, well, on page so-and-so, I wouldn't have said it quite like that, but basically it seemed fairly accurate, you know. So you kind of have to meet people where they are, like okay. Paul did in their own culture. And so um, it's a wonderful book for folks who are questioning their faith or who are ready to think about Jesus, but it does take a little while to get to that point. Yeah. Well, you said um, it, it took you a long time to, to get to that point. Even when, like when the minute Micah came home, you're just like, what is wrong with this whole thing? Yeah. And it takes, it takes Mormons a long time. I understand why they become agnostics or atheists, because all of their life they poured into something they thought was truth, and then they found out it's not, and it's like, then they wonder, what is truth? It's just not worth it anymore. Well, here's the other part of that, Lisa. They think they have the same God as you. Yeah. So if the... you don't tell them... When they decide their God is impotent and he's done all kinds of silly things and he can't really do anything powerful, they never think to come to you because mm -hmm. they think you've got the same God. So let's talk about that. God the Father is not like for, is, is a man from another planet. Plant it. How's that? Planet. Who's, who's worked his way to become a God. Is that correct? A created being, right, who was born at one point as a spirit child. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Mother, have celestial sex. They have bodies of flesh and bone, but their children are spirits. They wait in the pre-existence to be born physically on the earth so that they can begin their eternal progression, and for a man, eventually to godhood. That's all part of the system. And that's how God did it, and then he earned his godhood. Same so, thing with Jesus, he earned his godhood. So that's why John 1.1, 1, 1, he was God from the beginning? No, he earned his godhood at one point. So, so to them, Jesus, and everything I've been reading, Jesus is kind of like the older brother. Like, well, you just need well, to try to... firstborn. Uh -huh. Okay, so that's Heavenly why they Father say that. Father and Heavenly Mother. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's just so completely, it's just such a different Jesus. I was talking to a girl here that um, had come out of the Mormon church, and she said, the first time I ever said that, that they believe in a different Jesus, she said, I took offense to it. She's a Christian now. But she said, I was so shocked. I'm like, I've never been told that before. So I think maybe that's a good starting point. Like, you, we do not believe in the same Jesus whatsoever. Well, and you don't have to point at somebody's chest and tell them it's another Jesus. You can point them to those scriptures and ask them what they think. You know, literally, it's a process. I had to be in the Word for a while before that kind of stuff began to make sense. L let me give you a, another story. One of the first people God ever brought us to bring out of Mormonism was brought to my house on a Sunday afternoon, and she was bawling. So for four hours, she sat on my couch. I could hardly understand what she said. But this was her story. Her temple covenant, she had given her life to Jesus a year ago and, and kind of left Mormonism. 
but she'd gone to the temple a lot, and her temple covenants were haunting her, she said. What does I that said, mean, what's a temple I don't covenant? Know what that, I don't know what that means. Explain that to me. Okay. She said, well, I go to sleep at night, and then this voice is chanting in my head all of the, the promises, the covenants I made in the Mormon temple over and over and over, and then I can't sleep. And I remember thinking, that's not good. Yeah. You know, that probably doesn't have a good root. And now I'm, I'm a couple years out of Mormonism at this point. That's the first time it ever even occurred to me that the root of something outside of God and the Bible might not be a good root and might not be coming from a good place. Certainly isn't something you point out to somebody right away, but as part of the progression, you realize, right? You can't have two true gods. Mm -hmm. It's just, I think it's just a matter of walking with someone through this. It's not, a, a, an, okay, you need Jesus, you're going to give your life to him. It's like, I know for Nabil, he, you know, David worked with him for four years before, and the church kept saying, we're just not going to, he, he just has a hard heart, you, you, you're not going to save him. And he's like, he's my best friend, I have to continue to pray for him. So I think that's it, don't expect it to happen overnight. Sarah that we just pointed out that's here, she has a friend that she said witnessed to her for five years, mm -hmm. just wasn't sinking in. She read the book and boom, it clicked. Yeah. It kind of bridges the two worlds. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's, it's in, in for the long haul. Uh, do you think that a Mormon who has found the real Jesus should formally tell her family or let them see the change in her and let them ask her? That's a really good question. Yeah, eventually it's going to become obvious, and eventually you're going to have to tell somebody probably. And what often happens is as you walk this walk, at some point you give up your membership in the Mormon church. If you don't officially give up your membership, the Mormon missionaries keep coming to your door, your home teachers, your visiting teachers, everybody's checking on you. And that, that's really hard for someone in transition because as they're trying to get to know this new God, the old God keeps showing up. And remember what the Bible says about double-mindedness? And then sometimes you even want to run back. So I try to help them understand that they can separate relationships for a while, go one direction and make sure they're strong before they keep letting this interfere again. Um, one thing I deal with with Men and women who are leaving the Mormon church in their 30s, they're married, they have little kids, and yet their Mormon mom has called them on the phone every day of their life, knows when their kids are sick, knows everything about them, probably even knows about their sexual life with their husband. Things that I would consider to be inappropriate, and yet there's this really close family thing going on, right? So that person gets saved, and mom's still calling every day, guilting, asking them about faith, crying. Oh, you'll never be with our eternal family. And that really wears on someone, right, who's trying to go another direction. And those are the kind of things that, as Christians, you need to walk along beside someone. What is the weird eternal family thing? What is that all about? Um, the definition of eternal life. I probably life. didn't say that very nice, did I? <laughs> Only because my, I have a lot of questions on that. And, and my, my one question would be, if, if, okay, so I die. Okay, let's say we're family, and I'm a Mormon, and you're a Mormon, and we're going to be eternally together. But then I decide to leave the church. Doesn't the church teach that you can baptize for the dead? So can't you, in, in essence, baptize for me, and then I'm still going to be in your eternal family? Or does that not work that way? Not if you've heard the truth and accepted it and then walked away. That's different. Oh, okay, so it's a different, yeah. okay. So we got a lot of different rules going on. That's true. Yeah. And because scriptures are often contradictory, it's a little bit of a trick. You can pull out whichever scripture that person might want. Here. It sounds just exhausting and terrifying. Like, I, yeah. I think exhaustion, um, I think, does the Mormon church try to keep you very, very busy? Like, you have a lot of callings and you have a lot of things you have to do. Is there, a, do you think there's a reason for that? So that they don't have time to, to think? Or, because they're very busy. Like, I don't even mean that mean, like, but if you're well, so busy raising 15 kids it's and... It's work space <laughs> Right, that's what I mean. So I was about to say the definition of eternal life is 
families forever living with God. That has to be earned. It's not a gift. Eternal life in the Bible is a gift. But according to Mormonism, eternal life is something that must be earned. So you have to attend your meetings regularly. You have to hold a calling for at least a year. You have to pay your tithing for at least a year. You have to live the word of wisdom for at least a year. There are 14 things you have to do in order to earn a temple recommend, in order to be worthy to go into a Mormon temple. And then you have to keep going back, and then you have to keep doing all the laws and the ordinances and good works of Mormonism till the end of your life. And exactly like Islam, if you've done enough good, God's yeah. grace will kick in and save you at the end. But if you ask Mormons if you died today, would you be in heaven? They'll say, I hope so. Oh, that's terrible. Many, many similarities between Islam and Mormonism. Someone said, how should I share my faith with my Mormon coworkers? Is sending them this video a good idea, or is it better just to talk to them? Definitely talk to people in relationship. If you're going to use the video on Veiling Grace, actually the video that I showed part of is very non-offensive to Mormons. They'll typically watch the whole thing. Why would you have them watch it by themselves? They can't interpret any of that, right? Watch it with them. Invite them over and ask if it's okay if you watch this video and then ask them what they think. We're not, you know, just like anybody else unsaved. You're not cramming stuff down people's throats. You're getting a, a feel for their temperature of where they are with God and what they might be interested in. Yeah. Let me tell you a story. Uh, I don't know, last fall sometime, I was doing a radio show in Salt Lake. And I come out of the little radio booth, and here's a professor atheist, former Mormon, waiting for me. He wants to bash, right? So we're in a Calvary Chapel. We go to the little uh, cafe in the Calvary Chapel, and he's just arguing. Wants to, and at first, I'm jumping right in with him. And it was like the Holy Spirit said, just shut up and listen. I let this guy kind of cathart for a long time. And at about two hours into this conversation, he started talking about his divorce. His voice got broken. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit showed me there's a place of vulnerability. There's a place where you can bring God, right? There's a place where he might have an interest because this is something that's really deep and powerful for him. So why are you witnessing to people if you don't know them, if mm -hmm. you don't know their heart, if you don't know what they're seeking, if you don't know what their questions are? So I love Greg Kokel's techniques. He says, to open a conversation about faith, just say to somebody, do you mind if I ask you a question about your faith? Mormons are usually more than happy to answer anything. So you guys build temples. Why do you build temples? That's a perfect opening. They're more than happy to tell you about their temples. They love that. So then you can say stuff like, so it's like Solomon's temple of old, right? So you do, you do sacrifices with lambs in the front yard, right? <laughs> oh, you don't. So yours is not like Solomon's temple. Of, they won't be familiar necessarily with the Old Testament. You're planting the word of God, right? They might go home and look it up and go, wait a minute. Solomon's temple wasn't anything like ours. When did it change? Who changed it, right? Mm -hmm. You're trying to plant seeds so they themselves will go searching. You just can't hammer anybody with the Lord. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's just, you, you don't fight with them. You don't argue with them. You just, because that was our big thing. Like this morning before I came here, someone Facebooked and said, is this Mormon bashing? And I was, I wrote back and I said, we would never do that. Like, that's not our heart. That's not your heart. And, and she wrote back um, and said that you were a, what, what did I tell you it was? A disillusioned Mormon or something. <laughs> you know, and, and I said, well, does that hurt your feelings? And so how do you get past that when people really say, negative things about you. Well, we all deal with that, right? 
And this is a funny thing about God, right? In Mormonism, I'm this mousy, cooperative, do anything for you, work extra hours at the university, compliant, you know, obey the priesthood kind of person. God saves me, and then he throws me into situations like that yeah. where people are not happy with my testimony, right? At first, that kind of opposition, I would cry all night long. Oh, they don't like me, you know. Oh, I don't know how to do it. I got over that really fast. I started reading those things in the Bible that say, um, Jesus says, right, they'll hate me, and when I live in you, they'll hate you. Those are strong words. Mm -hmm. So then I realized they're reacting, right, to something they're uncomfortable with. And I can't really run away from it. I mean, God created the story. He's using the story. And so I've learned to be as bold but as gracious as possible. I love when Mormons will come. And I will just love on them and hug them and mm -hmm. talk to them about BYU. And um, we have to love. Scriptures say they will know we are Christians by our love. There you go. Two commandments now. Love the Lord your God. Love others. Mm -hmm. yeah. Last question. Uh, when a Mormon, when, you know, I know a lot of people always send me the Book of Mormon and they'll say, you need to read this and you need to ask God to, to, you know, to show you that this is the truth. And, and my cousins always keep saying things like, you know, they want to bear their testimony to me. W what does that mean? Like, what, what does that mean? Like, you, when you became a Mormon, do you have this fuzzy feeling? They always talk about a burning bosom. Like, what, what, what exactly, if I'm going to become a Mormon, what am I supposed to be feeling? Well, remember I said there were five points to a Mormon testimony, and Micah didn't say four of them. Mm -hmm. I know the church is true. I know Joseph Smith was a prophet. I know the Book of Mormon is true. I know we have a living prophet today. Jesus is our Savior. That pretty much is a standard Mormon testimony, and there are other things worked in. What's your testimony as a Christian? That, actually, that's a great open door. If somebody's giving you their Mormon testimony, why not say, can I give you my Christian testimony? You yeah. know, you wrote this down. I'm going to write mine down. And would you like to get together over lunch and you know, and hear what Jesus has done in my life, and you can tell me. Yeah. Yeah, open those doors for conversation, and don't be afraid. Okay, I'm going to start going and trying to be unafraid then. I'm this is my new thing. Gonna You're gonna, oh. She's going to call me every week. Have you called your cousins yet? No. I'm kind of scared. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was such a big, big part of the series. And we're so thankful that you're here. You are, they're teaching 13 times when they're here. Okay, so we are so thankful that you're, you're doing this for us. So let's pray and then we'll get going. Father, thank you so much for this incredible ministry for Lynn and Michael. I, we're just so proud of them and so excited for what you've done in their life. I pray that we can all learn from what they taught us today. God, help us to be bold to love people, to talk to them, to not be fearful when you come in contact with a Mormon. That, that in other words, we realize that we just we need to say something that will promote the true Jesus. I pray for that for each one of us here today. Um, bless Michael and, and Lynn's trip as they uh, keep them safe. Uh, there is seriously precious cargo in that car as they go from town to town sharing the truth about Jesus. For anyone here, God, that doesn't know you, I pray today is the day that they say, I want the true Jesus in my life, and I, I, I just ask for him to come in. And it's so simple, being a follower of, of you is so simple, I pray that other people will, will recognize that. Thank you for your word, the truth of your word. I pray that it will motivate us to read more and study more so we know what it says, so we have an answer when someone asks. In Jesus' name, amen. They are caring more about punching holes in the darkness than they are. The my life is his. I have committed my life to him to use me any way he pleases in order to make his name great. That's suffering for Jesus. And he's saying that is what is the norm in this kingdom of God. What is it that makes you cry or happy or sad or miserable? What is it that...
that, that, that every single one of these men were discouraged in their life, but they did something that I want us